Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, our Lord, at your divine baptism in the Jordan River, you revealed that you are consubstantial with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Enlighten our minds and our hearts on this day of your great epiphany. Make us holy by the indwelling of your Spirit, and make us worthy to celebrate this Feast of Lights, so that we may glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the Church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the one Father whose voice came from heaven, testifying to his beloved Son, and to the only begotten Son who is worshipped, whose light radiated upon the river, and who accepted baptism from John his forerunner, and to the one Holy Spirit who descended and appeared above the head of the Son. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. The earth rejoices in your epiphany, O Son of God, and the peoples and nations shout for joy on this day of your baptism. You have dawned from the Father and have sanctified baptism for us. O Church of the nations, proclaim the glory of the Son of God, who became man and was baptized for your sake in the Jordan River, and we cry out to him. Blessed are you, O Christ, the Word of God. You willingly emptied yourself and took the form of man. You gave us a pledge of life and the water in the waters of baptism, making us holy and heirs of your kingdom. Now, O Christ, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to sanctify us throughout this great epiphany, create a new heart within us, and make us newborn children of your Father, and pour out your forgiveness upon your flock, that we may worship you, glorify your Father, and give thanks to you, Holy Spirit, forever. Here. 
Christ, word of the heavenly Father, you became man for our sake and were baptized in the Jordan River. You became the way and the door that leads us to the Father. Grant us your grace and mercy and accept the fragrance of our incense that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Kadishat Aloha Kadishat Hayatono Kadishat Loho Yibuto Mishiko Jetame Menyuhanam St. Paul to the Galatians. The glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, before faith came, we were held in custody under law, confined for the faith that was to be revealed. Consequently, the law was our disciplinarian for Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a disciplinarian. For through faith, you are all children of God in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Greek nor Jew, there is neither slave nor free person. There is not male and female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are an Abraham's descendant, heirs according to the promise. Praise be to God always.
with the praise, glory, and honor <coughs> of the Most Holy Trinity. We burn this instance. Kyrie Eleison. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. <clears throat> From the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, who proclaim life to the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, the listeners. The holy gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The apostle John writes, now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler among the Jews. And he came to Jesus at night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you are doing unless God be with him. Jesus answered and he said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him in reply, How can a man once grown old be born again? Surely he cannot re-enter his mother's womb and be born again, can he? Jesus answered, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I have told you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it wills, and you can hear the sound that it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is, with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can this be done? Jesus answered and said to him, You are a teacher in Israel, and you do not understand these things. Amen, amen, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But you people do not accept our testimony. If I tell you about earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the Son of the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have life eternal. This is the truth, peace be with you. Before the faith came, we were guarded under the law, 
kept under restraint until the faith which was to be revealed. For this reason, the law was our pedagogue in Christ, that we might be justified by faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We all know the story of Saul of Tarsus outside of Damascus. We know of him and the bright light appearing around him, blinding him, leading him three days later to his conversion. The revelation of our Lord in his glory to this rabbi, this persecuting rabbi, who was on his way to Damascus precisely to arrest those who were following at the time that was called the way, just simply the way. Of course, we call it now the gospel. We know this story of St. Paul. We commemorated it on Friday, the feast of the conversion of St. Paul. What most of us don't know is when we read the letter to the Galatians, we also know that immediately following this event, that the only knowledge that St. Paul has of our Lord Jesus Christ is in glory, the resurrection. But the detail that we don't mostly know is following this event, St. Paul went away. He went to what he calls Arabia, which in the time would be basically for us southern Jordan, that area. And he went away for 14 years. And that's it. 14 years after this event, what God did with him and his soul, the illuminations he received during that time, we don't know. He never speaks of anything specifically of these 14 years. But at the end of 14 years, he comes out of this retreat. Something like St. Anthony. St. Anthony the Great, when he's 20 years living in this ruins of this Roman uh, barracks. And at the end of 14 years, St. Paul comes out and he begins what we know as his famous missionary journeys around the Mediterranean basin. And the first letter he writes is this letter to the Galatians today. It's probably our oldest and the first letter written about the year 48, 49. And so it's the first one he writes, and so in the letter to the Galatians, that is, as I usually do, I encourage you to read at least chapter three, chapter four, around what the text that we have today. Because St. Paul talks about the question of faith because this has been his immediate experience for these last 15 years. And so when he writes to the Galatians, he talks about this conversion experience, this event when he sees our Lord in glory outside of Damascus. And he winds up talking to the Galatians about their faith. And he's reminding them there are two things that we want to take away from this today. One is on the unity of the human race. And two is the question of faith. What is faith? We talk about faith as if every religion has faith as a central tenet, and they don't. Most religions, almost all religions, are observances, uh, things that you do. For the Jews and for the Muslims, they don't talk about faith. They talk about the law. They talk about the five pillars of Islam. The only act of faith in Islam is that you believe historically that God spoke to a man called Muhammad. That's the only act of faith. And everything, all the observances of the rule book that he gives, that's the basis tenet. In Judaism, it's essentially the same thing. You just have a historical belief told to you by your people that God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai. But after that initial act of faith, the rest of it is observances. Circumcise your boys, don't eat meat and milk together, don't eat lobster, etc. There are observances that you follow. And if you don't follow them, you're not necessarily considered a bad Jew. If you don't necessarily go to the mosque on Friday, you're not considered really a bad Muslim. But if you don't have faith in Christianity, you're considered a bad Catholic. You don't believe. So what is this thing, faith? 
Well, St. Paul, when he talks about it, it's this relationship that we wind up having with God. And this letter to the Galatians is all about this. And the first thing that he winds up talking about is this is an affirmation to what God is doing in the world. This is faith. Not just what God did for Muhammad at one point or for Moses on Mount Sinai. But this is a question that I believe and I accept, an affirmation, an amen. The affirmation of what God is accomplishing in the world in general now and what he's accomplishing and desires to accomplish in my personal life, that it requires affirmation. We all know, most of us would have known what it is like trying to rear your little children. They don't hear you nine times out of ten. They don't follow what you're telling. They're squirming all over the place. The moment that they do stop and say, okay, yes, Papa, then you have a moment to actually clarify something and try to get them to do what they're supposed to be doing. That's a very human image, but that's faith. That little kid turns around and looks at you and is listening. And you can do with them what you're trying to train them to do at this point. But the other nine times out of ten when they're squirming or running out the back door or just lost in the neighborhood, yeah, there's not much you can do. Faith is a relationship that we have on a regular basis with God. And so what happens, that's why you have the immediate question with St. Paul in this blinding experience being knocked off of his high horse. Is he asked first the question, who are you? Sir, Lord, who are you? That's the first question. Who is this person in front of me? And our Lord's answer is, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. You're trying to arrest people in Damascus who are me. That's an extraordinary thing to say in this experience for St. Paul. And over the next 14 years, he develops this profound understanding and relationship through God's grace given to him. But it's not vision. It's not the question of being taught algebra. It's not the question of doing mathematics. We don't see what God is doing in our lives. If you read the letter to the Hebrews, he glorifies, St. Paul glorifies these people of the old law because they act as seeing what is invisible. So faith also requires trust. That the God of infinite goodness is leading my life somewhere. That is also part of the faith. So it's a response to God revealing himself through the church, to me in my own personal prayer life, and through my participation in the mysteries, which I embrace because they have a certain credibility. Now, when we're children, the credibility is we believe in our parents. Mom and dad, when you're three, mom and dad are God. You know, my dad can beat up your dad because my dad is the most powerful and strongest being on the planet. I mean, eventually we grow up and we realize it's not really true. But when we're three, that's how God has created in the mystery of matrimony and crowning is that the faith be transmitted because the credibility is just, it's on even a natural basis. They look at you like a sponge and they absorb it. Now that's at three. At 13, it's a different question. You only have about a seven year period to kind of get it all in because after that, then they start becoming an autonomous being separate from you and quite separate through adolescence. And so, when we talk about this credibility, it's this ability to receive God's teaching to us in our lives. And it's always suited to historic circumstances. That's the fourth point. Meaning, while the faith always remains the same and exactly identical throughout the centuries, the way we're going to have to live it will always depend upon the people who are around us, the circumstances we're in. So it will always have an actuality historically within my life and within the life of us as a community. So there are very profound ideas in this letter to the Galatians about faith, what this is. And he uses faith as the basis of what he calls justification. 
We've talked about this. You know, we have the term when we talk about justifying a text, we're making the sides both perfectly flush and straight on our computers. That's the notion of justification. We bring it measure and balance. We straighten it out. We begin to try to patch and to heal in order to be able to elevate. So the basis of faith is quite profound in this sense. And St. Paul, of course, is writing from his experience and his analysis and his reflections and his meditations and his prayers over more than a decade following this experience. So that brings us to the second thing. St. Paul says that after the faith has come, we are no longer under a pedagogue. We've talked about this before. What is the law of Moses? And that brings us to our second point about the unity of the human race. The human race, and especially in this day and age, we talked about the actuality of the faith. We live in a, a generation, in a century of hysteria, where people cannot disagree on something but still discuss something without poking each other in the eye. I was very happy to see in the article that the Bishop of Covington in Kentucky has issued a public apology to these Catholic boys who did nothing in Washington, D.C., except, well, they were kind of goofy as adolescents, trying to react to the aggression from two different groups coming at them. So it was very good to see the magnanimity and the justice of the bishop in apologizing to these young men. We've all heard about the viral clip, the video, which then became another video because then we see another and then once you third person it, you realize, okay, what actually went on here? So the question of the, the unity of the human race and the question of racism, everyone's a racist and all of this, is that the Catholic Church has never, never considered race an issue. Race is a 16th century social construct. For the Catholic Church, there is only one human race. We are all the descendants of Adam. Doesn't matter what continent or what color you are. And for all those people who love blue eyes, that's a genetic defect. You're missing pigment. So in this notion of race, the church has always understood. That's why in the Catholic colonization of South America, or in the Catholic colonization of Quebec, the people were, well, their sentiment already was, and the positive policy was marry, intermarry with the indigenous people, which is why South America looks like South America. There are indigenous people living in the jungles, but the rest of Mexico, they're Mexicans. They're not Aztecs. They're not Spanish. They're Mexicans. Because the Catholic vision was, these are people, we've come to bring the gospel. We are establishing a community, marry the women. Marry into these people because it's one people. It's the Protestant vision of the Puritans who come and exterminate the people of New England, because they are in that century of social construct of races. These, and then they interpret them in a biblical sense. These are Canaanites. These are the children of darkness. We have come to build the city on the hill. We are the great liberated Christians. And that whole racist imagery is certainly not Catholic, which is why there are very few people of Quebecois blood who don't have some Native American blood in them somewhere. They all have some Indian blood. And God bless those people who came because that is the Catholic vision. On the natural level, there is only one humanity. There is only one human race, and we are all the descendants of Adam. That's always been the church's teaching. And now we know genetically that we are 99% DNA identical, each one of us to one another. It's only a 1% variation that gives you that pigment deficiation of giving you blue or green eyes. So that's the first vision. But of course, the vision of that for the church is that that human race was never God's full intention. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them with the ability of knowledge, and of love, the of will, the intellect, 
But as we've mentioned, human beings are created in the image of God incarnate. So the goal was never simply to create the human race, period. It was to create the human race in the state of grace, in that relationship of faith, which is why when you read Genesis, it talks about God walking in the garden, Adam and Eve talking to God. Clearly, God doesn't walk in the garden. He has no feet. What's being portrayed in the scriptures is this intimate conversation of fidelity, of faith, this relationship open to what God is revealing to us now. And as we know, what we call original sin is the moment when Adam and Eve, when Adam, when the human race said, no, we're not listening anymore. We do this on our own. And that is the fall. It's the moment where the three-year-olds run out the back door, no longer listening. What do you do with that? It's broken. And the relationship, if it continues that way, is wounded. It's not destroyed but it's wounded, which is why the goal that God always had was to enter the human race, even before the notion of sin, was always to enter and to be that exemplar of what humanity was meant to be, God incarnate, the Word incarnate, the Anointed One, the Messiah. And that is the second unity of the human race, in which, as St. Paul calls him, the new Adam, the new man enters among us. We celebrate at Christmas. We celebrate in the Epiphany. The appearance of God himself who is also man. And then in bringing through baptism and faith to bring us into that renewal that makes one corporate personality, one person, one whole Christ, the body of Christ, the new Israel, the church. That is the supernatural unity of the human race. The first one at the level of nature, there are beautiful things in human nature. Some people think it's blue eyes. But of course, the main things of beauty are the ability to know and the ability to love and to cherish beauty. There are wonderful things in the human race, but it's always wounded. It always falls short of its full capacity. But since the 18th century, we've lived in a world in the West in which we've tried to canonize just human nature. The Masonic idea behind it since the 1700s has been the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. That's not the Catholic concept. That's out of masonry. That is a naturalism to canonize just pure human nature. And while it's not wicked or evil, unless we see it as being to trip up the gospel, then it becomes wicked, it will always be, even in its best sense, insufficient. Which is why in this epistle today, St. Paul is talking about the fact of the renewal which comes by bringing. After faith has come, we no longer have a pedagogue. You have to remember that when God revealed himself on Mount Sinai to Moses, he divided the human race. You had Israel and everybody else. As I mentioned to you, that word Gentile doesn't mean pagan. The word Gentile comes from the Latin meaning nations. We had Israel and all the other nations. God causes that division in order to form a people, to prepare a people, to discipline a people, to teach a people, to form them over 1,500 years to prepare a cradle, if you want, to receive God incarnate which is God's full goal of what he always desired on this idea of revelation. But once he did that on Mount Sinai, he divided Israel from everyone else. He formed a wall around them. He divided the human race. And that is why St. Paul in his letters talks about when the Christ comes, he tears down these walls of division because he brings this human race into that renewed humanity within the body of Christ, that supernatural unity of the human race. And this is why in the gospel of today, our Lord says to Nicodemus, 
Amen, amen. This is an oath. Most certainly what I tell you, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God without being born once again in water and in spirit. Through baptism and faith, we enter into this reality of the new creation. So we have a unity of the human race at the supernatural level. At this point, we've achieved only a quarter of the planet. Because even if Catholics so famously go on and on about 1.2 billion, they may be 1.2 billion baptized. How many faithful among the 1.2 billion, I don't really know. A lot of empty pews around these days. But that's still only a fragment of all of the human beings on the face of the earth. Now, I wanted to bring this up because this is the epistle. Of course, this is what we're doing this year, is to talk about the epistles. But also because in the last century or so, especially, even among Catholics, especially in the last half century, we have fallen into an error that we call indifferentism, which means that any kind of religious teaching is basically the same and basic equal, equal goodness. Now, Catholics will kind of shuffle their feet because they're embarrassed, and they'll say, well, perhaps we have a little more truth than other people. But everyone is still really good. And Benedict XVI, even before when he was cardinal in the 1990s, he brought up this whole idea of religious indifferentism. What we wind up doing then is saying, your idea that if you eat a lot of cardamom or whatever, it'll get rid of your, tumorous, your cancerous tumors, that's fine. Because you really believe that. You leave in that natural level people in a level of woundedness without the justification that St. Paul talks about in faith. We leave people in that sense of where they are in something which is good, but insufficient. There's a reason why God died upon the cross on Calvary, because this does really matter. And if we had this sense of the unity of what the church is and why the church is here, and to see what the church, capital C, capital T, really is that we say in the creed that we believe in. Not the people, but the reality that when those people follow that faith and live according to that ability of trust, they are transformed. We've all known, saint, hopefully, we've all known saintly people. And we know that they're saintly because they actually follow the gospel. I'm still kind of shuffling my feet and thinking about it. And then death comes. But for these other people, they've realized what God is accomplishing through this supernatural level of the unity of the human race. That's the brotherhood of man. That is what makes us co-heirs with Christ. That is what makes us in this epistle today descendants of Abraham. The natural level, that's beautiful. It finishes at death but it's always insufficient in that death. But the church, she's eternal. That is a light of healing and of justification and of restoration. So it's not a question of feeling. She's got good intentions. He doesn't know. Well, that's why we have the gospel, to be able to help clarify and to teach and to bring this message, which is what St. Paul does after his 14-year retreat to communicate throughout the Eastern basis. He only does that for 20 years and he's dead in his 60s. And yet he is one of the great founders of Christianity which we benefit to this day, 21 centuries later. At that moment of death when our pure nature will fade away, what will we have been able to be, have left behind that's going to have that endurance of supernatural? What way have we communicated in our lives on that level? Read chapter three. Read chapter four of the letter to the Galatians. These are beautiful truths, though they're hard to live by. They're not complicated to understand, but to put into action, which is why he says that for many of you who have been baptized in Christ, you have put on Christ. It's the maturity of the Roman toga, the image he's using. You've all seen pictures of that huge piece of cloth they wrap all around their bodies. It's about 18 feet long. 
which is why most Romans, men, never wanted to wear the toga any more than you want to wear a tuxedo or your cocktail dress. You don't hang around in it. It's not comfortable. This thing wrapped all around you. But it indicated two things. One, you are a man, you are mature, and two, you are a citizen of the commonwealth, of the city. So St. Paul uses this image that there is now in this supernatural unity of the human race, that's where there is no, as he says, neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free man, neither male nor female. It's all this one unity of the body of Christ. And we communicate that also not only in our own lives to receive from God, but also to communicate to others by that faith. And to leave you with that last notion, what is faith ultimately, <laughs> fundamentally? It's trust. What does trust mean? You all drove here, I'm supposing. Well, a couple. Our beloved FIFA shuffled over. In order to drive, we have to make sure, we know that this, we hope that these people will stop at stop signs, that they will stay in their lane. There's trust. The fundamental aspect of trust is a confident relationship to the unknown. Does supernatural faith reveal to me what God is going to do in my life? No. Did he reveal to St. Paul that he's going to have his head cut off a mile outside the city of Rome in 25 years? No. Well, who knows? Maybe he did. Did he reveal to St. Peter that you'll be crucified upside down in the middle of a stadium for the games in Rome? Certainly not. Faith has that fundamental idea that the infinite God of goodness will accomplish in my life extraordinary things if I listen. Because faith is that confident relationship to the unknown and St. Paul finishes his epistle today by saying, and if you are Christ's, then you are the descendants of Abraham and you are heirs of all the promises made to that blessed patriarch. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Itelot madeb heid alocho, walot alocho dam chadet al yod, weinem silot ayin mutlaot heilul al baitok veskudet, chayet no od kodesho. Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered, for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, you are true love, security that is ever sure, and hope that never fails. Grant love, happiness, and everlasting peace to your children here before you. 
Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and souls, and with a holy kiss worthy of your blessed name, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. That each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. As we bow before your majesty, send us your grace and glorious blessings from the heights of your heavenly sanctuary, that we may glorify you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, you sent your beloved Son at the appointed time for our salvation, and he gave us these holy and life-giving mysteries. Do not look upon us as strangers, and do not turn your holy face away from us because of our many sins. For you alone are the Holy One, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. It is right and just to praise you, O Lord of all in heaven and on earth. The powers on high in the heavens where they dwell glorify you. The fiery ranks exalt you, the cherubim bless you, and the seraphim worship you. They cry out and they proclaim. Father, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, one and indivisible in nature, and you sanctify all things by your divine power. For our salvation, you sent your Son into the world. He descended, became flesh, suffered, and was crucified for us, who had distorted his image. Kyrie eleison, wabiyamu hadaktum harshon ilema bedchayim. And Sabe Lachmo Bida Kodi Shanto, who bought a Kodesh, Waxoya Bilitarimita Kodo Mara, Sabahula Mene Kulho, O no Denita, Bahuru Din, Dahlo Faikun, Wachlov Sagi. Oh, 
Kalkanno alko son dam sich wo men hamro men mayo bara ho kadesh wo ya bel talmi da karo mara sabishtao mehne kolho o no denita de mon dir diati ki khodato Dahlo faikun wahlof sagiye mete shadu meti hab khosoyon haume wa khoye dar alam alami Do this in memory of me For whenever you eat this body and drink this blood, you proclaim my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O Christ our God, we remember your plan of salvation and we implore your goodness. When you come in glory with your holy angels and all await the reward they deserve. And when you place the sheep to the right and the goats to the left, do not look upon us as strangers to your household and do not turn your holy face away from us. Do not let our sins and offenses pierce your holy heart and do not separate us from you. For we have professed your holy name and have proclaimed your divinity. Rather treat us according to your promises. Forgive our sins, pardon us, and have mercy upon your inheritance. For this your repentant church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we confess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God. Have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O oh my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin morio, anin morio, anin morio, nite mor rojo chayu kadisho. Unachena line war korbono hono. That by his descent he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May these holy mysteries sanctify the bodies and souls of those who share in them, cleanse their hearts, purify their thoughts, and be a pledge of the heavenly kingdom and new life forever. Lord, we now remember in this sacrifice all the holy churches and the shepherds of the true faith, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Rashada Peter, our patriarch of Antioch, Nasrallah Peter, our retired patriarch, Gregory John, our bishop, and all bishops. With them we remember the priests, the deacons, and all who serve your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice and strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith 
that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them to lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory. We pray to you, O Lord. For the peace and stability of the whole world, for a blessed and prosperous year, for an abundant harvest, for the sick and the oppressed, for all who call upon your holy name on land, at sea, or in the air, and who profess that you are one true God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, those who have presented the offering upon this altar, and those who desired to do so but were unable, and grant them their petitions. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. We remember all the saints, the fathers, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, Mary, the mother of God, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, St. Charbel, and all the righteous and the just. Through their prayers, make us worthy to stand among them. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, in your grace, those who have left us and have gone to you, to you from the first Christian disciples to this day. They resign with the seal of baptism and receive the precious body and blood of your Son. They wait for you in your life-giving hope. Raise them up on the last day, and in your mercy forgive all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed. With or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. O God the Father, you accept prayers and answer petitions. You taught us through your beloved Son to stand before you and to call upon you with pure souls and with clear consciences, praying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, done on, on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread. And, and forgive, forgive us, us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but to deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation and from harm of evil. For you have power over all, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. With your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, in your grace and abundant mercy, bless those who bow before you. Make us worthy to share in your life-giving mysteries and to join the assembly of your saints, so that with them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one holy, holy Father, one holy Son, one, one holy, holy Spirit. Spirit. Blessed, Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make, Make us worthy, O Lord God, God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy blood and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
again and again we thank you, O oh Lord. We raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat, your living blood to drink, the love of our people. Have mercy on us. Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your goodness and for the salvation you have just given us? Who can give you the glory you truly deserve in our weakness? And insofar as we are able, we worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Jesus Christ, our God, we worship, thank, and praise you. We implore your goodness and abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest to the departed, for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. Through your grace dwell in them, and by your abundant mercy give them life. By your cross bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you, to your Father, and to your holy and life-giving spirit, now and forever. Amen. So we just have one announcement this week that actually refers to next week. 
So during this week, of course, many of you might have had water in your own basements from the prodigious amount of rain we had. So the basement flooded in the church this week. And the last time that happened, it cost us $1,500 for the cleanup. We haven't gotten the bill yet, but I'm just throwing this out so you have an idea for the next time you see this little wicker basket coming by to understand that we have these extra unforeseen costs. And so, thrown out as a word for the wise. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.